Uh, hi, Samantha. Hello. Um, we'll wait another minute or two for uh, more people to join. Sounds um, good. There's another person. Remember, you, last week you mentioned to speak slower. So hopefully, hopefully I'll remember. I'm used, I'm like I'm from New York, so uh, for me it it, it it just goes. Okay. But, uh, but I'll I'll try I'll try to slow it down. Okay. That's the plan. That's a smile. Well, it's also easier to understand when it's slow too. You know it. Yeah, that's that's true. That's very true. Hi, Gloria. Hi. All right, we'll wait another minute in case there's anyone that wants to join, and then uh, we'll jump in. All right, I'll be home in a few minutes. I'm going to switch it to my laptop. Okay. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I'm just driving now. But with Gloria, it's it's uh the the sound is clear, right? It's smooth. It is. Okay, amazing. Thanks. Alrighty. I think we'll we'll get it started and um uh yeah, and if people join we'll we'll try to keep them in the in the uh in the scoop. Okay. So um, the name of the book, again, that we're learning is the Tanya, but we said we're learning a specific part of the Tanya, and that is called Shari um, Hayichud Ve'amuna, the gates of unity and faith. So it's, it's what all- What does Tanya mean? The word Tanya is, is, uh, is really, a, it's a word from the Talmud. Whenever you quote uh, a Tanaic source, You'll just, they'll, they'll start off Tanya. And, uh, and if you look in the beginning of the first book, it, it's quoting something from the Talmud, so it uses that word Tanya. That's the, that's the simple reason why it's called Tanya. Tanya is the same word as teaching. Um, it was taught. Which is the book over here? Uh, it would be this one. You can take a picture so I can, when I can get that. This, this book is just the second, uh, just the second part of the book. Okay, it's not yeah. the whole book. They have one upstairs after the class. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll show you one. They actually just printed one in Palm Beach, a special Palm Beach Tanya. You'll see it has a Lily Pulitzer theme. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll show it to you after. Um, okay, again, so the book is a Tanya, but the part that we're learning is the second section called Shayuch Vamuna. It's about unity of God and faith. Um, yeah, that's the word emuna, faith. Now, when when the idea of faith is a tool, it's a tool that we have to relate and to bring, take in uh, certain concepts, certain beings, certain ideas that are beyond our comprehension. In other words, there's something that's beyond uh, outside of us, and we want to bring it into our ex, our ex, life experience. So we have different tools. Uh, we can use um, our logic, our understanding, and that's a way to uh, bring, process something and bring it into our experience. But then, and that's the, probably one of the better ways of doing it, but if something is beyond logic, something is beyond our understanding, then we need to use a different tool. Um, we're going to need to use a different tool when, when we're trying to grasp something uh, Welcome. Yeah, some people on Zoom. <laughs> Hi, Hi. How are you? Hi, I'm Bobby Tani. Of course I know. <laughs> Amazing. 
But this is it, huh? Yeah, we have some people on Zoom too. On Zoom, okay. Um, so, so we were saying that uh, when it comes to grasping, bringing something into our experience from th that's outside of us, so we have uh, a few tools. Um, we have the tool of logic, of understanding, of uh, intellectualism, that we think about, we understand that concept, and now we could now we could relate to it, and it's part of our experience. Another, if there's something that's beyond logic, something that we cannot understand, so then the only way to really bring it into our life experience is the different tool. It's the tool of faith, the tool of emunah. That's the whole idea of faith, something that I can't understand in an intellectual level, so I'll believe in it. I'll choose to believe in it. So I'm still relating to it, but in a different way, with a different tool. That is, that is the concept of emunah. But something unique when it comes to Jewish faith uh, that we say and it is like this. Seemingly, when you talk about faith, based on the way I just presented it, there's what's what's higher, what's the what's what's better, what's more real of a way of relating to something that's outside of you. It would be logic. Logic is more real. It's you understand it better, you relate to it better, it fits with your what's the whole idea of, of logic? That it there's certain rules. And the way your that's the way your brain works, the way your brain understands, and whatever you're relating to fits within those rules. So it really fits with you. It's more uh, personable, more relatable when you understand something uh, via logic. Um, if you can't use the rules of logic to 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 take this idea, so then you have to, you know, go for the next best. We said the tool of faith, the tool of emuna. So seemingly, according to this, faith is lower is a lower way, it's not a preferred way to deal with uh, something. That is seemingly the way it, it presents itself. But the truth is that for a Jew, um, or when it comes to faith in God, it's not a lower uh, way of relating to it. On the contrary, it's higher, it's greater. It's, in a certain way, it's more preferred. What do I mean? Um, the fact that a Jew believes in God it's something that can be logically explained also, and we meet, we'll get to that soon. But the truth is that it's because we experience God. A Jewish soul always has its connection to God. And in a certain sense, everyone really has this connection. That therefore, we always are uh, feeling the presence of God. We are always uh, experiencing God. So even though... Not necessarily is it something that we can understand. We can't always understand God. We can't always understand God's way, but we're experiencing it. You can't imagine uh, someone experienced uh, a good thing, a very good thing, or a very bad thing, a very tragic thing. And it's something they experience, and then someone's going to come to them and say, oh, never happened. What you experienced never happened. Yeah, I mean, uh, it was mentioned recently, someone someone was, was spoken about in the news about someone that was speaking about a, uh, the, the, the killing of children in Sandy Hook quite a few years ago um, and making all these conspiracy theories that it never really happened, you know, but then tell it to the parents of, of the children that were killed, you know, how insulting is that? Uh, and there, you can try to bring this proof and that proof how it never really happened. Look, you see, they, they, they did this, they did that. It must not be true. No, when you experience something, it's unshakable. The truth of the of the thing that you experience is unshakable. You you, just, you experienced it. So faith uh, is an experience. It's not just a tool that we use. You know what? We settle for faith. We settle for emuna. Really, it's a it's a it's a it's a certain part of our soul that experiences God. That's what emuna is, and it's in a, it's in a truer way because uh, when we understand God in an intellectual logical way, then God's limited to the rules of our logic limited to the rules of our uh, sense of reality. But if we, if we experience God, just because we experience him the way he is, not based on the, our, our rules, that's a, a more true experience of God, a more true way of relating to God. Um, so that's why emuna is something so uh, important and treasured in the Jewish faith. Um, but on the other hand, even though it's so important, 
uh, like you see the title, Shar HaYichud Ve'amunah. But on the other hand, it's important also to try to understand as much as we can. And this we spoke about last week. Uh, briefly, there's a what the first one of the Ten Commandments is God says, I am your God that took you out of Egypt. I, I exist. The mitzvah is to believe in God's existence. That's the mitzvah. But we said that, that seemingly you can't say that that's a mitzvah. Because how could you, what's a mitzvah? A commandment. But how can you have a commandment to believe in the commander? Which one comes first? You have to first know there's a commander and then you could start having commandments. So what, what's this mitzvah to, to, to believe in God, that God exists? What is this mitzvah exactly? And we explain that the mitzvah is to um, understand as much as we can about, about God, and then whatever is beyond understanding to have faith. In other words, we have to get to know God. We gave an illustration of a story uh, last, last week. We have to know God as well as we can in our terms, and whatever is beyond our understanding, then we say, here, here is where faith comes in. Here is where Amunah comes in. So the commandment is to intellectually uh, get, involve ourselves with God's existence. And then, and whatever is beyond that, again, to leave to Amunah. So we have that obligation to understand as much, as much as we can. And we have to do it in that order specifically. First the Amunah, first the faith. And then we try to understand what we're believing, what we have, what this faith is, to try to understand it in logical human terms. That's the, but it's in specifically in that order, not to be, not in a cynical way. We're questioning the truth, you know. Rather, we accept it. We have faith that this is true, based on our experience or based on our Jewish soul's experience. But we also have an obligation to understand as much as we can. Again, not in a cynical way. We don't, we're not going to question the truth. Rather, question if we can understand the truth. That's, the, that's what we're trying to do. Um, therefore, last week we spoke about this idea that God uh, creates the world c constantly. Every second, God is creating the world. Not just that God created the world 6,000, you know, 5,000 plus years ago. And it was a one-time event. Rather, it's something that's constantly happening. God is consistently putting in uh, his divine energy into the world. Um, and that, we said, is based on a verse that it says God's words are, are, uh, will forever be in the heavens. And we said that Baal Shem Tov explained that to mean which, which words of God are, are, are always going to be in the heavens. The, word, the words of God, when he spoke in the beginning of the Bible, the beginning of the of Genesis, where it discusses that let there be affirmative, let there be the heavens. Those words are constantly within the heavens. That's what we spoke last week, uh, that God is constantly creating the heavens. And we said so too is every everything really in, in our world is constantly being created. But that was based on a verse. That was, we just presented it as a fact. But we didn't, we didn't understand it logically, why it has to be that God is constantly creating the world. We just took it as a fact. It's a verse. The verse said this is the way it works. So that's, that's it. But the goal of this week is to take this that we uh, heard as a fact and we believe is true to understand it, to attempt to understand it in logical terms. That's the goal of this week. Um, and it's important to understand it in logical terms because the goal like we discussed of, the, of this book, is to understand the unity of God, how God is one, um, even after he created the world. And if we would not be able to understand God's unity, that would mean that there is a place where God's unity does not exist. In other words, God's un unity is not complete because there's a place, our minds, that doesn't, uh, doesn't relate to this, doesn't understand this. That's what it would mean. So it's, in, so it's important, imperative to, to, to understanding and to uh, know that God's unity, God's oneness is complete. And therefore, it's important for us to make sure that e that truth even enters our human, uh, lowly uh, intellectual minds. So that's why it's important for us. Um, 
So here we go for this chapter. I just want to introduce the chapter by uh, quoting a few a few stories. Uh, a tzaddik once said, a tzaddik is a righteous man that has divine, uh, is more, way more in touch with the divine than, than we are, let's just say. Uh, a tzaddik once said, as he was lifting up a, handle, a handful of sand and letting it run through his fingers, this is what he said, he who does not believe that every one of these particles returns exactly to the place that God wishes is a heretic. Another quote, the Baal Shem Tov, he gave the imagery that sometimes a great storm comes, hurls everything about, and causes the trees to shake violently, that the leaves fall. One such leaf may drop close to a worm. And it's for this that the hold was in a storm. For what? That a worm may eat of a certain leaf or be protected by this leaf. That's why it happened. So uh, what we're getting to is the idea of divine providence. Another thing we're going to get to, a uh, quote from the quote David Ben-Gurion, which, by the way, was not a religious uh, person, as, as we well know. He said like this, that a Jew that doesn't believe in miracles just isn't a realist. That's what Ben-Gurion said. So we're going to touch upon uh, divine providence and miracles, the concept of miracles. Here we go. The chapter starts off by saying, based on what we said in the last chapter, it's going to expose the source uh, of the mistake of the, of, the, 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 of the heretics, their worldview. And we'll get to that in a second. Now, he says the word, this is the source of their uh, mistake. Now, it's just a lesson we can always learn from this is that when it comes to debating, a lot of times we debate on the conclusions. And then it's always, you know, who, who, who has better skills in the debate? That's usually who will, uh, you know, come out looking better after the debate. But it's always better to just go to the source of where, you know, it's the source of uh, the, 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 the differences of opinion. When you go to the source, then it's all clear and there's nothing, it's not something that can just be left to skillful debate. You, you, you expose the source of the, of, the, of the opinion. And that's the same thing we're gonna do here. So he calls them the heretics. Which heretics? The heretics that don't believe in uh, divine providence and the miracles that are mentioned in the Torah. Um, what, what, why do they think like this? What's the source of their mistake? So let's go through the steps for a second. What, what we're saying is that they don't believe in the, that God is involved in the happenings of the world. God created the world, but he does, they don't believe in that, that God's involved. God will intervene in the world. That they don't believe in. Um, now, this, so that's what their actual uh, opinion is. Again, that God does not intervene. God is not involved in the happenings of the world. That's the actual opinion. What's the source? Where's the source? Why do they come to this conclusion? Why do they have this perspective? That's what we're going to get to. And where's the source? The source comes from the way they perceive creation itself. Again, there's creation. And then there's the after creation happened. How does the world uh, run? So what we're talking about is they, they discuss that the world runs on its own. God doesn't intervene. There's no divine providence. There's no miracles left on its own. Um, but the source, that's just in the happenings of the world. But the source, the source of their opinion really comes from the way they understand creation itself. And that's what we're going to address. In their minds, God created the world. It was a one-time event, and he left it to its own devices. The Hebrew words would be Azab Hashem and Sa'aretz. God Azab, he left the world uh, to, be, to, to work on its own. Again, so in their mind, they think that God created and left the world. Uh, and therefore, they think the world lives on its own and God is not involved. And then they take it a step further and say that since the world is such a, a, a strong, uh, important existence, it exists on its own, therefore, uh, God can't even intervene. That's how much they, that's how uh, powerful uh, they view the nature, the world itself. 
The world runs on its own, and it's so powerful, uh, the nature of the world, that it can't, God can't uh, get involved uh, and change that. But the truth is, obviously, that God is, like we said before, God is constantly creating the world. Uh, so it's very natural to believe that God is still involved in what happens. Again, if he's constantly focusing, constantly conscious, constantly creating what, and, and knows what, so that he knows everything that's going on in the world, and he's constantly creating it the way it is. And we spoke about the, the beautiful out, uh, thing that comes from this, is that uh, there's, no, there's never a moment in time to give up hope, because God is creating that instant, the, every part of the circumstance. Someone can think the circumstances are unfor uh, unfortunate and shouldn't be like that. And, and, and now it's nothing, you know, it's, there's no reason to live or God forbid, that's like to the furthest extent someone can think. But if we think about it, God is creating the, the moment you're in with all of its circumstances. That's a whole nother, uh, that gives us so much hope. God, obviously, if he created me in this second, it means he has what he wants for me. Not only the moment I was born. Now, we all know we say, oh, if God didn't need you, he wouldn't create you. You wouldn't be born. But that truth that we say about someone being born is really true every second. In the aspect of uh, death, for instance, first to what you just said, God is constantly but now dead. You know? Are you part of, of God's um, platform agenda? Of, um, you're saying yeah, because you're dead, but you're still no. That we, you're so that's a, a soul, right? Yeah, yeah. So the soul will, will lives forever. That's a different uh, yeah. discussion. The soul lives forever. Uh, but we're talking about specifically this this world, this physical world. Yeah, but, um, I, I just have, sorry for interrupting you, but I have a question. How do you relate to the Holocaust if you believe that God is involved in every minute of the day? How do you explain it? That's a, How do you let it that's, that's a very good question. The question was, for, for those that weren't able to hear, how do we... If we're saying that God is, is conscious every second and involved in the world, how can something uh, as as uh, as the Holocaust? How can something like the Holocaust happen? And that's that's a that's a very good question. That is that is the strongest question uh, in, in any religion, but that is the strongest question uh, against God. And it's a question that I don't know if we would even want uh, why it happened. We don't want. I don't. We don't want to know an answer. But uh, how, did he let it how did he let it happen? That's 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 something that we don't uh, we don't really have an answer to. Why why did God think that this is something that had to happen? So how can you still believe that God is involved in every every minute? Got a sheep? Yes, but. The rest of this, I so, don't so, it. so perhaps that's what resorts to what we discussed earlier. That's that's where our faith kicks in. We don't understand every aspect of it, I, but we do believe it to be true. Yes. Can I tell you what I was taught at Kabbalah when I studied it? Br briefly. They, yes, they said oh, yeah. that it was reincarnation from the people that were with Moses. They were reincarnated, and that's the, those people are the ones who were in the Holocaust and died. Wow, I've never I've never heard that. Yeah. Um, what was mentioned was that it was taught at a Kabbalah class that one of the attendees here uh, was at that the, all the souls that perished during the Holocaust uh, were reincarnations of the Jews uh, the, the that were of that served the golden calf that were uh, there in the desert. So we'll just that was that was shared at a uh, Kabbalah class. Not not this one, but a, a, a Kabbalah class. Okay. So here we go. Again, we spoke last week that um, there's three we, we, that there, we have to know God as, as good as, as much as we can, understand God as much as we can. And there's three steps to get to where the Tanya is speaking. Step number one is that God made the world. But that doesn't mean that God created the world. It could, it could mean that God organized the world. He put it together. He synchronized everything. But God had some sort of matter that he at his disposal, that he, that, and he synchronized it and arranged it in a way 
that now the world exists the way we see it. Uh, and that's, that's something that, at least that much is something very clear, very easy to, 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 to speak about on an intellectual level. A story that's always used for this, mentioned last week, um, was the rabbi was someone sitting with a, a government official, and the government official <laughs> was debating him and saying, who said God created the world? The world could just be on its own. Who said? And um, throughout the discussion, the, the government official, uh, by mistake, knocked over an ink, the inkwell. And it went all over the table. So he said, OK, one second. Let me go, let me go get uh, you know, a, a towel or whatever to, to, to clean up. As the government official left the table, the sage took the ink and uh, made a beautiful picture. So, and then the person, the government official comes back and he sees this beautiful painting, this beautiful drawing. They ask him, who made this? Who made this drawing? So he says, what do you mean, who made the drawing? The drawing's just here. So what do you mean? He said, I don't know, the ink, <laughs> the ink spilled and it just happened to, to, to land in, the, in, the, in all these places on the paper that made a beautiful drawing. Uh, so the person, the, the government official is like, that's ridiculous. You can't, you can't say that, that it just all fell into the place. Obviously, there must be someone that, uh, that, that, uh, that, that made this happen. You, 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 you want me to believe that the, you want me to believe that the, that the ink just fell in the right place? They said the same thing. So the sage turned to the government official and said the same thing, uh, is what you're telling me that this world, which, which, and with science, we, we see this clear and clear. Everything fits in the exact right place. Everything is so synchronized. You want to say that this just happened on its own by mistake? No, you must say that there's a God that put it together. That's step one. Then there's step two, uh, saying that not only God organized uh, the world and drew this beautiful picture, but He actually created it. God's a creator. He took, uh, he, he, made, he made it out of nothingness. And the term is ex nihilo. There wasn't any matter that God was using and organizing. Rather, he, he created the matter itself. That's something also that can, we, can under, we can prove uh, in an intellectual uh, understanding, the logical uh, rules and terms, but uh, it's, I think it's beyond this, this class. So we can do it another time. Another setting, maybe after the class, but we'll leave that for another time. The next step is to say that this creation, that's, ha that's ex nihilo, that came from nothingness. God didn't have any, any uh, material to use when he created the world. That, happened. that creation happens every second. That's what we established last week. Um, and this last step is what we're going to prove lo in logical terms uh, during, this, during this class. Again, that God has to constantly uh, make this creation happen. So here we go. What we're gonna, what we're gonna, what we're gonna say is, and you'll see throughout the class, is that this world is something that's totally new. It's a novelty, and therefore it, it will, it will always lack its independent existence, and therefore it needs, it will always be dependent on the creative force that's creating it. And, uh, and that's why we're going to, the conclusion will be that God has to constantly create the world. It can never, its existence can never be attributed to itself and therefore it can never independently exist. That's what we're going to say. The, to understand this, let's use an illustration. The way the heretics looked, you know, we're just calling them heretics. I'm not trying to be disparaging. Just, just that's the term we're going to use for them. Again, the, the ones that d deny God's, uh, divine providence, they deny God's miracles, God's intervention in the world. So they, the way they view creation is the same way creation, manufacturing happens in this world. You have people that make a vessel, make a machine. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about a, a vessel for a second. A nice, beautiful, golden, silver, you know, pitcher. So Originally, it was just a block of gold or silver. Now, they created, yeah, through, through the techniques that the, that the silversmiths and the goldsmiths used, they created a vessel that didn't exist before. So that's, that's a beautiful example of creation. Now, once the 
once the, uh, the person makes this vessel, this pitcher, they can leave it on its own, you know, and not have to keep on making it. Yeah, that's just maybe for a little better illustration. Um, it comes to pottery. So you know it's on the wheel, it's spinning on the wheel, and you have to kind of constantly keep its form. But once you're finished, now it's, now it's good to go. Anyone can use it. You don't need to be there the whole time to, to make sure that it stays in form. Um, it's just, uh, so that, that's the way it works. Now, why is it different? Because if you think about it, the fact that you can take silver, you can take gold and make it look into a certain form, that's not something new. Silver can always be put in that form. Maybe it wasn't yet in that form, but silver always has the uh, capacity, the potential to be put into such a form. And when you know the technique, it's not something new introduced here. It was just done. It was just performed by a skillful uh, uh, worksmith, whether it's silver, a silversmith or a goldsmith. Uh, just extrapolating the potential that the, the block of silver already had. There's nothing new here. It's called yesh mi yesh, something from something. It didn't come from total nothingness. This concept of a vessel always really existed, at least in the potential state. Um, now, what we're saying is that, on the other hand, we did mention that they, uh, the heretics, they do believe the first two steps, that God exists as an organizer, but not only that, that God also created ex nihilo, something from nothing. He created the world from nothingness. Um, so it's so how are we comparing it to, to a, a vessel being made, which is the, the bar of gold or silver was there the whole time? Um, this, is, this, is the, this is the this is the important distinction. But if you know him, you could call him. And him there, voice note, and listen, this guy is not to be missed. He's a, a rock star. He's going to be able to address it. Sorry? Um, the, the, the difference is like this. That let's let me give you an example. You have a table in a room. So the table was actually the table we're using now, funny enough, was over there before. Okay. And now it's here. None of you saw how it happened. Let's say it was a very heavy, heavy table. You'd be like perplexed. How did that happen? Who was strong enough to move it? You know? But now that it's here, it makes sense that it's here. It's sensible. It's understandable. Okay. That's one thing. But let's say you would be, uh, someone would tell you that they saw a triangular square. Again, someone said they tell you they saw a triangular square. So what was, that would be something that doesn't make sense. Even if you tell me that you saw it, it's still something that's not, not fathomable. It's not something you can really uh, grasp. Not only how did the square get into the, the triangle, it, the, 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 the existence of such a thing itself doesn't make sense, is not sensible, is not sensible to us. So in their mind, yes, uh, how did, God didn't have matter that, to use at his disposal. He created the matter itself. But now that it's here, it makes sense to be here. Just so for, in their mind, it's like the table was on one side of the room. Now it's at the other side of the room. Maybe uh, you need a god to, to, to make that happen. You need a, some sort of creative force to make the world exist. But now that it exists, it makes sense that, it's, that it existed. It's not something that's you know beyond comprehension, beyond common sense, it's beyond our, our sense. And here, it's here. Now it's here. Um, that's how they looked at it. Again, so on the one hand, it's not literally like a, like a vessel because the vessel has some silver that you're using to, to make it, to create it. You had some material. But the point is that once it's made, it makes sense to be here, and it can exist on its own. On the other hand, uh, we're, the way we, we're going to uh, present it is that you know, the world is like, it's like a triangle and a square at the same time. If, so, if, if God could do that, it still wouldn't make sense to us, though. Maybe God can do such a thing, but it doesn't make sense to us. It's not something sensible. It's not something that should continue being in, in such a form. In other words, physicality, physicality is unfathomable. And it will therefore will always be something that's flimsy. Its existence will always be flimsy. Why is that? So 
We quoted last last week, and we're gonna uh, the book called Sefer Yitzira, the book of formation. We mentioned that this is the oldest uh, book in Judaism. Uh, its source not necessarily was written, but its source it was said by Abraham. And we have it now in a book form, and it's called Sefer Yitzira, the book of formation. And there it mentions like this. It says. Hashem, God, made what doesn't exist, exist. And God made what doesn't exist, exist. Now, it doesn't say that he made physicality, he made the world exist. Rather, it says that he made what doesn't exist, exist. Meaning, what doesn't exist is existing right now. Now, we'll explain what that means. When we talk about existence, so let's talk about the differences between spiritual existence and physical existence. Something that's spiritual doesn't depend on any circumstances to exist. For example, uh, two plus two is four, right? Does it need? Is it only in this room that it's true? But if you go to a different room, two plus two might not equal four. It doesn't depend on its circumstances to be true. That's spirituality. On the other hand, physicality, it does depend on the, the space that it occupies. If it didn't occupy space, then it, it wouldn't exist at all. Physicality, by definition, is dependent on the space that it, that it, that it, that it, that it, that it occupies. Um, but if you ask it, what is it about, it can't really tell you. Um, Again, spiritual, sp something that's spiritual is something that has uh, truth to it. Something that's physical isn't truthful, and that's why it depends on the space that it that it that contains it. Uh, the, to illustrate a little bit uh, how uh, untruthful the world is, imagine you have someone that's a, you know a, a, a convicted fraudster. You know, he's committed fraud. He's a liar, and the consistent one. So he, had, in order for him to for someone to know that he's saying something truthful, he needs to walk around with, uh, let's say in Torah law, it would be two witnesses. You need to walk around with, with people always attesting that, oh, what he just said is true. He walks around with his two witnesses wherever he goes, saying, oh, what he's just said here, that's true. Whatever, that's true. What does that show? That this person is a liar, by definition. <laughs> and maybe there are some truths here. So same thing is with physicality. Physical existence is not true on its own. It, it depends on the place to testify that there's something here. The space that it's in needs to testify, oh, so to speak, that th there is something here. What is it? It occupies space. That's what its definition is. The definition of physicality is that it occupies space, but not that it has any uh, specific uh, content to it. Um, therefore, we don't say... The bigger the table, the more true its existence is. On the other hand, you would say the bigger the intellectual idea, the more true it is. What does it mean? It's bigger. It encompasses more things. It tells you the truth about more and more things. So um, what we're pointing out is that uh, physicality on its own doesn't really make sense. Uh, the truth is, even spirituality, spiritual existence, well, that's something that you can't really touch. Uh, for example, let's say 2 plus 2 is 4, right? At the end of the day, even though it exists in every room, it's true everywhere in the world, but it's not something you can touch. So it's still limited to its sphere, the intellectual sphere. But it's not something, it still doesn't, it's not everywhere, everywhere. It's still dependent on some sort of circumstance. Um, on the other hand, obviously, God is, godliness is, is not dependent on any specific circumstance. Now, um, so the fact that physicality does exist is nothing to do with the fact that it's truthful. Rather, it only has to do with the fact that there's something creating it, making it exist. Uh, for example, if someone sees a stone flying on its own, now there's one person that sees a stone flying on its own, just flying in the air. Okay, he'll tell you, look, I was just outside. You should have seen there was a stone flying, a flying stone. Another person comes into the room and says, you should have seen what I saw. I saw a triangle 
and a square, a triangular square. That's what I saw. So they're both saying something that to us we don't relate to. Um, but when, it, when, when a person describes a flying stone, I could, I, could, I, could, I could picture it in my mind. Maybe I don't understand how the sto stone is flying. How would a stone fly on its own? But at least I can picture the fact that the stone is flying. But if someone's describing to you a triangle or a square, it's not something you can even imagine. But still, you could, you still know what a square is. Again, let's, say, let's go back to the stone for a second. You know what a stone is. You know what flying is. You're just not sure how they came together. But you could imagine, you could, you could, you could at least Im imagine the, the the illustration of that of a flying stone. But then, when someone will describe to you a triangle or a square, on the one hand you can't picture it, but on the other hand you do know what triangle is, you do know what a square is. You just not you can't picture them together. Then imagine uh, someone walks in and says, "You know what I saw? I saw nothingness." When I was outside, I saw nothingness. Now you you have you have nowhere to start even. It's this what you can't even begin to imagine. What is he even saying? Again, when it comes to the triangular square, you know what a triangle is. You know what a square is. You like you're kind of like trying to picture it, but 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 you can't really you know get it together. But if you want to try to imagine picture nothingness, there's nothing to start with. There's nothing to even, it's not fathomable. What does that even mean you saw nothing? It's a blind person. So that a blind person, it's not that he saw nothingness, he's just not seeing. He's not seeing at all. I'm just saying he saw nothingness. That's uh, something that's unfathomable. So the truth is that that's how Hashem, how God sees our, uh, sees us, sees physicality. From a godly perspective, what is this exactly? It's it's no has no content. It just takes up space. So so what it has nothing, nothing no truth to it. What is that? To God, from 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 the the way existence was before the world, the world was created, from a godly perspective, what is physicality? It's nothing. There's no truth to it. What what does it even mean that such a thing should exist? What we're trying to bring out is that naturally. There should not be existence. Now, we're not only saying that there shouldn't have been existence, what we're trying to point is that even now, nothing should exist in a physical level. Again, because to God, to godliness, to, to pre creation, the, the idea of physicality, of physical existence, is enough, is like, is to us, like to say you saw nothingness. It doesn't even begin to, to be sensible. And therefore, it's, uh, it's, we, can't, we cannot compare uh, the creating of a vessel to, yeah, like a pitcher, of, a silver pitcher or a golden pitcher to, to the creation of the world. It's, when you have a vessel, it's, it's sensible that now, it's now, now that it was formed, it's here. But if you talk about the world, talk about the physical creation, it never uh, begins to make sense. Never is natural. It's never, never a natural state of being. Um, when a, to illustrate this, if you have a vessel and now you want to uh, break it apart, make this vessel not exist anymore, how would this happen? You would need an outside. <laughs> you would need a, an out. You, you would need a kid <laughs> or someone destru destructive force to come, an outside force, and come and destroy the vessel from existing. But, the, but even when, it, let's say, this vessel doesn't exist anymore, it was destroyed. But the vessel on its own tells you, I should, I should exist. I should be existing. It's an outside force that maybe said otherwise, and it overpowered the vessel, so to speak. But the vessel on its own terms would still be, should exist and does exist and, will, and should be continuing to exist. That's, that's, one, uh, that's one state. Um, but then, let's say you create a vessel that was programmed in a way to deteriorate over time, and eventually it doesn't exist anymore. It ceases to be a vessel. So then, it's different. Seemingly, 
it was it wasn't an outside force that made this vessel not exist anymore. Rather, the vessel itself was programmed in a way that it should decompose. So it's not an outside force. But no, the truth is that still there's a reason why it doesn't exist anymore. Can I tell you? Well, we're running out of time, so sorry for that. But I definitely love the interaction and the, the questions and answers. Um, so, again, we're trying to illustrate that even after it exists uh, or ceases to exist, it's different. So, again, so a vessel on its own, if it was destroyed, the vessel itself would, sh would tell you I should still be existing. So, the idea of existence is still there. Let's say something was programmed in a way that it should not exist, it should cease to exist over time, decompose. Still, there's a reason why it doesn't exist. On the one hand, yeah, you're right, nothing, there's no outside force that made it uh, uh, cease to exist, but there is a reason why it doesn't exist. It was programmed in that way. So it's still in existence, enough to an extent that you have a reason why that existence doesn't exist. But it's significant enough that you need a reason for it not to exist. But what we're saying is, uh, no, that when if the God would stop creating the world, the world would go back to its natural state of nothingness, as if nothing ever happened. Uh, the illustration for this that's uh, commonly used in Hasidus would be the throwing of a stone. Uh, when you throw a stone, uh, the stone is not a, a flying stone. You introduce something new here. Um, but when the stone stops flying through the air, stops being, uh, when it's thrown through the air, uh, it's not an outside factor that causes the stone to stop flying. Uh, rather, it just stops on its own, as if the stone was never thrown to begin with. You see a stone on one spot in the, the beach, let's say. And then someone threw it you know, through the shell to another spot of, on the beach. There's nothing that, the, the fact that the stone was settled here and settled there is the same exact, it's the same exact. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing that changed uh, within the stone. Um, another, maybe a better example for this would be a mirror. When someone's in front of a mirror, their image exists there. But when they leave, you don't say, oh, really, the, the image should still be in the mirror. And there's just a reason why the image is not in the mirror anymore. No, the, the, the image was never, like, never really there to begin with. And that's what we're saying about the world. The world is never really there to begin with. The independent existence of the world is never there to begin with. Uh, a poetic uh, image of, say, of this would say like this, that the world is held in the arms of God, otherwise it would fall into the abyss of nothingness. So again, what we're saying is that naturally the world should not exist. To God, it's like seeing, it's like someone telling you, I saw nothingness. What does that even mean? You know? So the world naturally does not exist. If it exists, it's only because there's an outside force making it happen every second. But on its own, there's no reason for it for it to exist. Um, that's what we're saying. Again, it's na the world naturally does not exist. And that's what the Save for Yitzira, the Book of Formation, was saying. God made what isn't, is. What, what God made what doesn't exist, exists. Meaning, what by definition, by nature, does not exist. The concept of physical existence, by definition, by nature, does not exist. God made that exist. That's, that's what it means. God makes what something that naturally does not exist, he made that exist. At the same time. So on the one hand, it naturally doesn't exist, but it's still existing. And the way he illustrates this, the way he proves this, actually, he has a proof for this from the Torah. From where? From the greatest miracle in Jewish history. What's the greatest miracle in Jewish history? What do we point to as the, like, the miracle in Jewish history of Jewish destiny? The splitting of the sea. Right? The splitting of the sea is the, you know, would be the iconic Jewish miracle that, you know, determine our destiny forever. Um, so it says it's, it says in the Torah when God described when it's describing this miracle it says that God uh, sent a wind he blew a wind he, uh, he sent a wind the entire night holding up the water to be like a wall 
doesn't say this idea of being like a wall, but it held up the water to stand in its place and not come down. So what you see is that um, the miracle that God is doing, which is against nature, doesn't work with nature the way water naturally is. God has to constantly make that miracle happen. If God wouldn't continue blowing that wind, then the water would just come down. Now, that's the, that's the proof that he uses. It's just like when it comes to the miracle of the splitting of the sea. God had to constantly, consistently make this miracle happen. So to the miracle of creation, God has to con- constantly do, uh, make, perform this miracle of creation. Just like he has, to, he has to constantly perform the miracle of the splitting of the sea. That's the proof that he uses. Now, Question, simple question that should come up right away is, what's unique about the splitting of the sea? Uh, you know what? I can give you a very simple example for this. Not even a miracle. You have a cup of water. You have a cup of water. Now, water, naturally, should go all over the place. You know, water, it says water always finds the lowest place to be. That's like its nature. But no, it's not doing that because... There's a cup that's containing the water. It's holding it down. Just like just like the splitting of the sea, there was the wind that was holding the water up. So so why do you need a miracle of the splitting of the sea? Talk about just a watering cup. That uh, if you don't have the cup anymore, the water goes back to its nature, which is to spill all over. That's a simple question to ask on, on this idea of using the, the splitting of the sea as a proof. But this is not, it wouldn't be a good proof for what we're talking about because... When you have a water in a cup, is there any change in the water itself? Yeah, we have these bottles of water on the table. There's no change to the water. The water stays water. The water is still going down. It's just that it's contained, it's, it's space that it can work with is a lot smaller. There's an outside force that's containing the water, but the water isn't changed at all. Um, on the other hand, uh, when, like we used the illustration of a stone earlier, the stone, now I don't know how it works uh, in physics and science, but definitely the way it's spoken about in, uh, in Hasidut is that when you throw the stone, the stone itself is lighter. It's, it's, there's an energy that, you, that came from your hand that's in the stone now that caused the stone to be lighter, to, fl- to, to, so to speak, fly through the air. So the stone is changed for this, as long as the energy that was invested from your arm is still within the stone. But now the stone is a different stone for that amount of time. On the other hand, in a cup of water, nothing changed in the water. And what we're saying with creation is that God made, again, God made something that doesn't exist, exist. Something that doesn't uh, make sense to exist, exist. Meaning he, he didn't just uh, force it to exist. He made it itself exist. Just like the water uh, in the story, the water uh, didn't just, wasn't just held by a wind. It, rather, it actually uh, it actually stood like a wall. Now, how, what's the proof for this? That it wasn't just contained like a cup of water. Um, we know, in the, at least in Medrash, it says that the water split into 12 pathways for the 12 tribes. Have you, any of you heard that before? That when the sea split, it was 12 pathways for the 12 tribes to go through. Now, if you say that God was the wind was kind of holding the water back from coming down, and how did you have separate passageways? All the water should have been pushed to one side, and that's it. How do you have 12 separate passageways? It must be that the wind, the miracle was that it was causing the water itself to stand. Again, different than than water in a cup. Water in a cup, the, the, nothing changed to the water. It's just contained within an outside element within the cup. But when it comes to the miracle of the splitting of the sea, the water itself was standing. So that's why it wouldn't be good to use an illustration of just water in a cup. Because creation also, creation itself, God is making what doesn't exist, what naturally doesn't He's making that exist. He's making a change here. <clears throat> so then the question, another simple question that comes up, um, I uh, Samantha is asking, where does it say the water is split into 12 uh, passageways? Uh, after the class, you can reach out to me and I'll send you the source. Um, so another simple question you can ask is, so why not every miracle? 
Why are you choosing specifically the miracle of the splitting of the sea? Any miracle is something that God made a change. Yeah, for example, uh, when Moses, God spoke to Moses at the burning bush and said, I want you to take the, take the Jews out of Egypt. And Moses said, they're not going to listen to me. I shouldn't be the person. You know, he said, I'm not a man of words, etc. So God, and so God said, here, I'm going to give you a sign that I sent you, and they'll listen to you. One of the signs he gave him was to put his hand in his shirt, by his chest, and to take it out. And what happened to his hand, the Torah says? His hand got, became white. It had leprosy. So I'm just giving you an example uh, of a miracle where God made a change. Why is, why is, why is such a miracle not a, a good illustration of creation? So this, I think, is, is fairly simple. Because, um, again, we, dis we discussed earlier, you can have, let's say, a, a, a table was moved from one side room to the other. You're just, we're just curious how it happened, how it got from one side to the other. But the fact that the table is in the other side of the room and it's staying there, that makes sense. So when it came to that miracle of God uh, making Moses' hand have leprosy, so we don't know how the hand all of a sudden contracted leprosy. But the, for a hand to have leprosy, we can, it's sensible. We can understand that. It's not something that constantly doesn't make sense. It's just that we don't understand how it miraculously changed from being a healthy hand to a, to a white hand of leprosy. On the other hand, the world, we're saying, uh, can't, never makes sense. That's what we discussed earlier. It never begins to make sense. It never begins to be sensible. And therefore, uh, any miracle wouldn't illustrate the point. We need specifically a miracle that is constantly being performed because, uh, like, like in the illustration, the water naturally is was naturally flows down. Uh, on the other hand, God made a change in it to stand, but it was still water at the same time. So it's water, but it's standing. It's water which naturally falls down, flows down, but it's standing at the same time. You have two opposites at the same time. You need... That's what you, that's you need God's uh, power to make this happen. And you need it to happen every second. To make two opposites happen at the same time, you need it to be the, 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 the energy that's ha making that happen needs to be there in, uh, constantly. Now, the question then is, um, we, we, use, we kept on using this illustration of a throwing of a stone. So why don't we just, so why didn't we use that? And by the way, in Chassidus, not in this book, but in other books, that is the example that's always used throwing of a stone, not the miracle of, of the splitting of the sea. Now, this question is really a lot stronger. Really a lot, a lot stronger. We mentioned that this whole chapter, we start off the chapter by saying that it's we're answering the heretics. We're answering uh, the way the heretics view the, the way, the view the conducting, the conduction of the world a certain way. And the, the, the source of their mistake is the way, they, the, the way they perceive creation itself. And we're proving to them. How did creation happen? That it constantly happens every second from a miracle. What did we just say? How did we start off? What are the heretics about? What is their opinion? That God, there is no divine providence. There is no miracles. And you're proving to them that they're wrong from a miracle. They don't believe in that miracle. They don't believe in the miracle of, splitting of, of the splitting of the seed. So how is that a proof uh, against their opinion? They don't even believe in that. That's a question, the strongest question that's always asked on this chapter. And the answer to that will uh, help us understand. This is something very, very uh, instrumental. I know we're going a little over time, but uh, let's see if you can hang in there. Uh, um, the truth is like this, that the, 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 the talking, so to speak, to the heretics, focusing our attention to them uh, and their perce perception of, of, of how God runs the world or the lack thereof, um, that we finished up already. Again, we said the world naturally does not exist, and it's still today it doesn't naturally exist. God must constantly make this non-existence exist. Two opposites happening at the same time. That was what we directed at them. We, we finished up with that. This whole uh, introduction of the, uh, the fact that we introduced this miracle of the splitting of the sea, that is for something else. That is for the believing Jew. That is not for the heretic. This is for the believing Jew. And it's to answer a question that specifically a believing Jew will have. The heretics will never have this question. Specifically a believing Jew will have this question. What is it? The question is like this. 
God, uh, according, uh, God is, in short, God is totally beyond the rules of everything. God, he made the rules. Like we said before, God didn't have material, have something he was using to create the world. There was nothing. It was just him. So, in other words, the concept of time, the concept of space, the concept of concepts, the concept of rules, that how you have to work a certain way to do something. That is all created by God. God is beyond that. God doesn't have to work with these rules. He made the rules. You know? I'm sure you can uh, yeah, have they are like parents. Like, kids ask them, how could you do this? You told me that you're not allowed to do this at night. You're like, I made that rule. I could break the rule, you know? God can create the world in a way that even though it naturally should not exist, it exists. Or in other words, God could change the nature of existence. He can say, even though that naturally the world does not exist, I'm going to change that nature and make it naturally exist. Just like the hand before was, uh, the, the, there was a healthy hand, now it's not healthy. So God can, you know, he changed the hand, so to speak. So God can change the, na- the, 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 act, the essential nature of existence or, or lack of existence and say, you know what, now you should exist. Now you should naturally exist. And then God wouldn't need to co- constantly create it. He can make it naturally exist. He doesn't have to fit with the rules that we said. How can you have two at the same time? Not, not exist, but exist. God is beyond that. God can change, change the actual nature of non-existence and make it exist. He's beyond all the rules. And this question specifically a Jewish believing person will have. That, that God is totally beyond uh, all the rules. And to that wouldn't help giving an example from a, a stone that's flying through the air, that was thrown. Because that's within our world that the stone, if you want to make a stone, which naturally is on the ground, you want to make it fly through the air, you have to, it needs, it needs to constantly have this energy that you put into the stone to make it fly. But once the energy is not there, the stone will fall down uh, instantly. That's how it works in our world, because there are rules in our world. To have something uh, go against its nature, you need, the, you need the force to constantly make that happen. But that's just in our world, with our rules. But that wouldn't prove anything about God. God is beyond the rules. So, so, that wouldn't, so God can make creation in a way that it exists on its own. It has its own independent existence. And, uh, and that's it. And then, and then uh, God cannot be involved in that world anymore. So specifically to this believing Jew that has this question, that God is beyond the rules, and who said he's sticking to the rules, you need, you need a, a proof from the uh, splitting of the sea. Because what's the splitting of a sea? What, what happened? God decided to work in a way within the rules, so to speak. The rules are that if you want to make something that naturally, water that naturally flows, you want it to stand, you have to constantly make it stand. That's the rules that we under the, the way of our lo- the way our logic understands. So, uh, and God didn't have to do, work like that, but He decided to do that. He decided to make the miracle of the splitting of the sea happen in that way. That He had to constantly do it. So that shows us that how does God wo- uh, work? How does He uh, how does He perform miracles in this way? That He works within our our uh, rules of understanding. So, if, uh, so that shows us that that's the way God also works with creation itself. So again, throwing of a stone wouldn't be a good example because that's how our rules work. That's how our world works. But God is beyond those rules. So the only proof you can have is from a godly act. Let's just see how God acts. And then we can know how he, how he acts by creation itself. So just like in the miracle, the splitting of the sea, that, how did God act? How did he choose to act in a way that fits within our understanding, the rules of our understanding, uh, that if you're going against the nature, you have to constantly do that, constantly perform that. So that's how God created the world also. Uh, there's more to say. Um, I will save it for next week. But I always want to leave off with a lesson. Um, so the lesson for this, from this, obviously, is that uh, God is constantly uh, involved in our world. And he had the option to not be. He had the option to create the world, let it be on its own. Uh, and, and we wouldn't understand how God does that, to take something that's to, to something that doesn't, by, by nature doesn't exist and make it exist, and, and now it exists on its own. We wouldn't understand. 
He could have done. He had that option. He had many ways of doing creation, but he specifically chose the way of creation that we could relate to the most. It shows us that God wants, and this is what we spoke about last week, about pan panentheism. God wants that we should be able to relate to him as much as possible. And therefore, he chose to create in a way that it happens every second, which fits within our parameters, our rules of uh, logic, so to speak, so we can relate to him more. Uh, and there's more to say about that, but that's the lesson, that God is doing, going out of his way so he can be uh, as relatable as possible. Again, he's not limited by creation, uh, but at least something that we could relate to on some level. That's the uh, that's what to take from it. Always there's more to say, and uh, thank you everyone, everyone for joining. I'm sorry for going over time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Anyone has any questions? Anything wasn't clear? Um, so, friends, you can ask. You can ask now. You can ask me by email. I also wanted to say I want. I'm always looking for feedback. So. Uh, I know last week I went through a lot of, like it went through a lot. It wasn't like, there was a lot of different things we mentioned. And this week also could be felt like that. So if, if you feel like we should maybe simplify it in a way that we're not running through so many different uh, concepts and, and uh, allegories, et cetera, uh, feel free to let me know. And uh, then I'll, we will change it up a little bit and try to stick to more, more to stick to one point. And everything. Yeah, again, the, the con, well, we always get to just, I want to say over what we discussed. We discussed that last week we mentioned that the, the God creates the world constantly. This week we just, we kind of, we tried to prove that logically. That, and the way we did that was by saying that the world by nature, physicality naturally does not exist. But God is making what naturally does not exist. So God has to constantly uh, make that happen. You can't, if he lets it go, then it goes back to its nature, which is non existence. Uh, we gave that illustration. God is holding the world. And if he would let it fall, it would fall into nothingness, just like we said. Uh, if you let it fall into the abyss, back to nothingness. So, uh, however we, however we said that. Um, anyways, yes, everyone have a good, good night. And looking forward to uh, seeing you by the next class. Can I say something? Sure. So 